Hello, everyone, and welcome to Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. Actually, this is our law and crime author series, and I sort of deviated a little bit today because what we have today is something I'm really excited about. We have a police officer who's also a movie director, producer. He wears all the hats. And I, I think that's amazing because, first of all, any of you guys that know about police work, there's many talented people in police work, and not just in law enforcement. They're talented singers, they're talented actors. In this case, he's a talented movie producer, director. And where do you get all that grit from? And where do you get all that talent from? And where do you get all that know-how from? Well, seeing the reality of the streets. And that is one of the places that we get this from. I remember uh, when we interviewed Chaz Palminteri, uh, he said, cops are natural actors because they have to be actors to do the work they do. And I somewhat agreed with him. I said, that's pretty, uh, that's correct. But, you know, something, you still need to study acting if you want to, if you want to be good at it. But yeah, we're all natural actors because we have to use that in the work we do. And sometimes to save our own lives, we are able to act in a certain way. And think about being a movie director slash producer, all the hats that Jerron Lockridge has to wear. And because not only is he producing and directing, he's hiring the actors. He's making sure the actors show up on time. He's hiring his crew. And all of this probably has to be done in a, in a small budget because Hollywood's not behind Jerron at this point. But you know something? That's not bothering him. He's one busy dude. So... With that said, I want to I want to bring up. I'm going to show you the thumbnail. Here we are. This is Jerron, Law and Crime series, Tennessee police officer turned movie producer Jerron Lockridge. Growing up in Bolivar, Tennessee, a small town 45 minutes east of Memphis, Jerron became interested in filmmaking as a high school sophomore in 2002. Believing a career in Hollywood was nothing more than a far fetched dream. Jerron graduated the police academy in 2010 and became a commissioned peace officer in the state of Tennessee. As an outlet from the stresses of the job, Jerron began writing again, and in 2016, he started his production company, Misguided Perceptions Media Group. With no formal training or film schooling, he began to teach himself how to produce independent films, primarily self-financing his film, saving his paychecks from his job as a police officer. He has since produced 11 feature films such as Betray, The Reaper Man, and Down Bad, Life in the Hood. He believes his niche is telling human stories from an authentic perspective using his experiences of working the streets in uniform as a police officer. His latest film, The Sticks, is a promise fulfilled to a close friend and former cast member whom the film is dedicated to. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to Jerron Lockridge. Jerron, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be here today. You know, Jerron, what a great story. And, and, and I'll tell you the truth, you know, you, you hear there's so many cliches in police work, and some of them are true. And people will always say, when you leave the job, they'll say, there's life after the police department. You've heard that, right? I'm You've heard that a million times. And you're making sure that your life is going to be on the path because you're setting a path already for when you do leave. Talk about yeah. that a little bit. Yeah, I, I remember in the uh, when I was in the academy, uh, one of the instructors uh, made it a point to emphasize uh, how to find something to do outside the job. Find something that you love to do outside of the job. Don't, you know all your friends shouldn't be cops. Everything you do shouldn't be cop related. Find something that you love to do and, um, and do it and, and kind of separate yourself from police work. And that always stuck out to me um, when he mentioned that. And it's, it holds true um, because being able to do something and just kind of leave work at work has been one of the the greatest things, um, you know, especially with the stress and everything that goes on with this job today, because when you're feeling that burnout, because you're just always about police work, having this outlet has helped me quite a bit and um, helped me to get away from it all. So um, that's one thing that stuck out to me 
uh, especially at the academy that I always think about that instructor. I can't think of his name for nothing, but I remember his face and him telling us, find something to do outside the job and, you know, it, it'll help you on the long run. And he was so right. You know, Jerron, some uh, are teachers in life they don't even know that they're necessarily our teachers. And I remember someone said something to me in the academy that I wish I had taken the advice, but I didn't. And he said the simple thing, loose lips sink ships. <laughs> and I wish I had taken that advice because I had a big mouth. You know? <laughs> but uh, it's so true, right? And like, you think of the little lessons that you learn. And not just from police. You could learn a lesson from kids. You can learn a lesson from someone in the street, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, the reality of police work, though, is so perfect mm -hmm. for what you're going into for the field because I'm sure the characters you meet, the things you experience, they wind up in your films. Want to mm -hmm. speak about that? Yeah. Um, a lot of things, like especially when I first started back to writing, um, was more as a, a outlet uh from the you know the stresses of the jobs and everything they're just going to writing and then the more and more films that i produced i started to realize like i'm in a a, a unique spot uh i i experience things that most people don't get to experience i get to talk about things from a authentic perspective that most people don't have they go to tv um to to hear how cops deal with things or or these crime stories um from people who've never experienced that there is a fictionalized way of, of 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 having these stories where i've experienced them so i can come in a more authentic way so i, I started to lean into that more i started to lean into writing stories uh especially here recently um in more of a a, a way that uses my experience to to make these stories feel more real and and that's how i came out with um the sticks and a couple more works that i'm i'm working on uh just using that to to my benefit because a lot of people uh, especially writers out there they, they can't say they have the experience i have and it influences a lot of stories to the way that um certain interactions with characters i i i use that because I've, I've experienced those interactions when certain situations happen in, in my story. So it, it definitely helps with my writing. That's wonderful. You know, I'm going to play a little, a short little uh, trailer from your uh, recent film, The Sticks. Okay. Okay. I'll do anything to make this right, bro. I promise you. i do anything. Don't do this. He'll do anything, huh? Say that thing. This ain't the first or last time our leash was tied in one day and we'll loosen the next. Right now, we got the green light. Take advantage of it. What's up? Buck told Martell you ain't copping work no more. So word is, Martell think you only offensive. I don't even want you. I want Martell, and you gonna help me get her. There's never been a war where the economy didn't take a nosedive after the first shots were fired. I suggest you figure this little situation out and do it fast. Because I have no intention of slowing that wheel down. Wow, very impressive. Uh, I, I I love that. That was that was that was fantastic. And you know, you could see watching that the grittiness of the characters. You know, those characters I'm not seeing on Blue Bloods. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not seeing on, on a network TV show. Yeah. And as I spoke to you uh, off the air, I think we're both two lovers of that amazing show, The Wire, that was on yeah. HBO. Yeah. And that's what this reminds me of. It's very gritty, and you can see the characters of a street. And I love that, you know. And the hard thing about this, and the thing that I, I don't think television ever gets correct, is to write the lingo of the street. Difficult, yeah. right? Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, when I created this show, like The Wire was a definitely an inspiration because the way that that show brought Baltimore into that show, like they, they had natives of Baltimore who never acted and brought them into that show. And it just brought a level of realism that I don't think any other show has touched because uh, The Wire is top two one of my favorite shows of all time. And it, it definitely inspired the way I wrote the sticks um, just to the way of bringing the streets and how the streets are uh, into this project and, and showing the, the, the human nature of the police in this show and the issues that they deal with. Uh, one of the detectives in there is, um, you know, trying to raise a family as a single mother getting um this check that you know people think maybe somebody in a fair tale land thinks cops make a lot of money and they see her check and the stuff she's dealing with um in her life and just humanizing um so much um in this show is, is my intent is, is as an officer myself and just showing that you know people think that you know we're Superman or something like we bleed and breathe just like everybody else. So that was a lot of my intention with this show that that was inspired by the wire is just bringing human stories and, and realism into that, into this movie, like that show did so well. That's great. You know, Jerron, you also, I asked you off, off camera, uh, you're a dad, mm -hmm. uh, you're married and you have three, three children, right? Three boys. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's a challenge, too. And the things that you see in the street, you mm -hmm. may come home and bring that to your boys. Like, I don't want you guys. Well, you know, you see horrible things in the street. Yeah. yeah. Those lessons that you learn as a police officer, I'm sure wind up as lessons to your three boys. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of <laughs> a lot of things like they they hear me fuss about all the time, like, uh, you know, leaving the door unlocked and. Um, you know, when you go out to eat, you know, make sure you sit with your back against the wall. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Little stuff like that, you know, is that I bring home to them. But I think they starting to realize like why now, uh, you know, the, the world is a is a complex place. And uh, just having that attitude of preparing them to always expect it, you know, never be lackadaisical, you know, let never, you know, just sit around unassuming, you know, always uh, watch you back and, and be safe because uh, the world is, is not a nice place. It's, it's stuff that's going on out here. So a lot of the job does kind of go into just making sure they're prepared and and, and always expecting the unexpected uh, out here. So it's just trying to find that balance uh, with all of this, with, you know, going to court and, you know, trying to do these movies and just having enough balance for your family is always a struggle. Uh but uh, yeah, it's just trying to keep them prepared for this world. How did the other cops relate to you, not just as a police officer, but knowing that you're an aspiring, not just aspiring, you're doing it. Yeah. You're a movie producer slash director slash writer. Yeah. Are, are guys sucking up to you because they want parts in your uh, your next movie or what? Not really. You would think that they would, but you know, it's uh, everybody has different taste. Uh, you know, I, I, it's really something that until recently a lot of people didn't know about uh because i would i would do it on the side and you know i might mention it to a few of the guys but they were like oh okay they just let it kind of go past their ears i don't think they believed like what i maybe just thought i was talking and didn't believe that i was actually out here doing the filmmaking thing but yeah here recently like uh, a lot of the projects are starting to get seen so they're like man i didn't i didn't know you did this i mean i used to hear it but i didn't realize you were actually out here making movies so uh, it, it's a lot of uh, realization here lately that I, this is something that I'm actually doing, and it, it's kind of neat seeing uh, some of the guys respond to it. But but do they do they ask you? Many of them ask you to be in your next movie, or I have wanted to. You know, <laughs> wanted to. Hey, I wanted man, to. <laughs> whenever you have a role, make sure you call me. And yeah. you know, you, you, sometimes they're playing because I've, I've called their bluff a few times, and when you when you call their bluff, I'm like, oh, okay, he actually did that. But yeah, I have. A few here every now and then ask me, man, whenever you got a role, let, let me know. I want to be in there. <laughs> That's very cool. Now, the the, the actual stories, mm -hmm. are, you, are you writing the, the film also besides producing and directing it? Yes, I'm I'm involved in everything. Uh, because here at this moment in time, this you know, low budget 
uh, it, it just it costs so much money to do everything that you see behind the camera. So one thing that uh, when I first started writing, I did try to go out and hire out people, cameramen and sound guys and this and that. Um, then I realized like, wow, that take up everything that I have uh, to make the movie. So I started just kind of teaching myself the skills, um, using the cameras, directing and all this and that. And I've, I've gotten this little system myself where I write it. Um, I cast the movies. Um, I actually, while I'm directing, I'm the one that's doing the camera work. Um, wow. I'm a cinematographer is on it as well. Um, on this last movie on the sticks, actually, I hired a sound guy for the first time. I used to handle the sound myself as well. Um, and, and I also edit the movie. So I'm pretty much um, having to do a lot of the jobs myself. And I've gotten to a point to where now um, I can do that without you telling, being able to to notice that I'm the one doing all the jobs. Right. Uh, a lot of times uh, people see the movies and they're like, you did all of this? They, so that's a good sign when you don't believe that I'm the one that's doing everything. So I'm that, doing that sounds like. Yeah, that sounds amazing that you that you've taught yourself how to do all those things. That's like especially editing. Editing has got to be really tough. Yeah, yeah, because you you can make or break the movie in the edit, and uh, it's actually the thing that I'm I'm focusing on improving the most um, because it's, it's so much with editing is you know the pacing and everything is controlled in editing. So um, the more I, I'm one of those. I love feeling the story. I, I want to have time within the story. And I'm noticing a lot of people, they want the story just to keep moving. So that's something I'm learning every movie uh, where the, to kind of pick up the pace and edit. So the editing is it's the hardest part. It's the most time consuming part. Uh, but you can really make or break a movie in the edit. And, and it's starting to kind of be the part I most enjoy uh, in the movie making process. Wow, that that's a ton of uh, a ton of things to do with one man. Let me just play another. This was another one of your films. I think it was an older one. I'm yeah. gonna bring it up on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, When you watch those, that, how does it make you feel? Does it's it feel like that's old news and I've moved on from there? Yeah. yeah, sometimes I look at some of my older stuff and I, I wish I made different decisions. <laughs> yes. Because now looking at that trailer, I'm like, I can see somebody like, what is this about? <laughs> you know, like yeah. what's going on here? So yeah, that was a uh, that was a cool little story about a um uh, a, a guy whose um his sister is uh terminally ill. Uh, so he's trying to get money to um, get a procedure that she needs. And he's going through some difficult decisions on that movie. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, one of my older projects. Well, good for you. Now, yeah. how, how long do you, how long are your movies usually? Usually uh, they're around the 90 minute, uh, the standard, the 90 minute. Um, a few of them may go around two hours. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, usually pretty much the standard 90 minute hour, 30 minute, uh, 
movie runtime. That's a that's a lot of time to fill. I mean, really tough. Uh, I mean, here's another one, Betray. Mm -hmm. That was a shot. And I'm going to read a list of the movies you've done. Uh, okay. The Sticks is the most recent. Betray 2023. Mm -hmm. The Reaper Man 2023. Down Bad Life in the Hood 2023. Mm -hmm. Sakuba 2022. Close Caption 2021. Down Bad TV Series 2021. And uh, I think it was Smith, Smith uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. You're a busy guy. I don't. What do you get time to do all of these movies? My God, I usually try to. I try to stay consistent and do at least one a year. Uh, a, a lot of those are uh, just kind of seeing, you know, what genre is uh, responsive. Um, you know, audience wise, what genre is are they responsive responsive to, and just trying to write to see. Uh, what direction I need to go with my company and, and, and pursue when it comes to these, these films. And, and what I'm realizing is um, like the show. Uh, well, it, it was a show and I re-edited it into a movie uh, down bad. Uh, the sticks. Uh, I have another uh, detective crime mystery. Um, Cuba Zaconia that's coming up. And I'm just realizing that the, the, the projects that have the greatest response are those type of projects um, because I, I believe my unique voice is what's capturing people um, that they, they see like with the sticks um, as we roll this movie out there, they're seeing like I, I, there is a unique voice about it, which I can only credit to, you know, me being a cop and, and making these stories. So I'm noticing, you know, over the Reaper man as a horror film did okay uh, but I mean, it's nothing that's different from what you've already seen. Whereas, you know, something like the sticks and some of these other shows where I'm able to show, you know, authentic stories, I, I see those are capturing people a lot more. And that's the, the route that I'm noticing that I need to take moving forward with my, my films. Now with the stories, uh, these are obviously personal stories to you that you've lived through your life as a police officer, through your personal life. Mm -hmm. Does anyone recognize these stories uh, in your films as, oh, that was the so-and-so case? <laughs> Not really, because I, I usually, in in that degree, I will fictionalize um, the story. I will always um, fictionalize it because I don't, out of respect from anything that I've worked with personally, I don't want anybody to feel that I have went and use that to make a movie out of it. You know, I want to respect people like that. So more than anything, I will just, I'll come up with a fictionalized case or a fictionalized storyline. And more than anything, uh, if I do copy anything from my experiences, it's just the reactions and the, the way these characters interact when certain things happen. Like I would know how a mother would act if she's lost her son. I would know how um, a, a drug dealer would act when you his house is raided and and you arrest him and how he would react with the cops. Like I would use those um, real life experiences and interject them into the dialogue and the situations with the characters more than the story itself, uh, because I don't ever want um, anybody to say, "Hey, that's my life that you just wrote about." You know, I wouldn't want that right. to ever happen. And then too, um, like my department knows what I'm doing. And I wouldn't ever want them to feel like I'm out here exploiting real life things that's going on as well. So I usually always fictional come fictionalize a story and just interject um, my real life experiences into the way these characters interact so that it comes off authentic on the screen. And I think I think it does. I think it really does. You know, I remember I, I was um, I told you I did some acting and I did six episodes of this show that was on IG uh ID channel. I'm not going to tell you the name of it because I what well, the, the story I'm going to tell you is pretty funny. They were like a low budget too. Uh -huh. So they would like want to shoot a scene in a parking garage and they would take two vans. They would just pay for it and they wouldn't tell them they were shooting. And I was like, I can't believe you guys are doing this. And they would go in and shoot their hour or whatever and just, hey, we paid for that. And I was like, that was great. You know, but uh, I can imagine if you told the garage, oh, yes, we, we want 500 an hour or whatever, you know. Yeah. They paid their parking fee and that was their set, which was a beautiful set. And no one bothered because they didn't know they were there. Yeah, yeah you, you have to get creative, especially on the low budget realm because – 
it, it can get up there. So yeah, you have to get creative and do, do things like that. Uh, I guess you didn't do things like that though, Jerron, right? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't anything. Yeah. yeah, I'm too in my head on certain things. So like <laughs> I'll try to uh I try to do it the right way as much as I can. <laughs> well, get get those permits. They cost money though, right? Oh yeah, they do. But here in Tennessee, uh that's one good thing about uh here specifically. A, a lot of uh public places and stuff like that you don't need permits for, uh unless you're like shutting down a street or something uh that usually has uh public access, you have to go get a permit. But here uh, so far, we don't have to worry about that. So that's a, that's a good thing. Absolutely. Except what if you're shooting a scene with guns? you got to let people know that you're out there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And and most of the time, because I do have like um, blank guns that I that I shoot with that are that's why I can't understand what happened with the, the incident in Hollywood a few months back. But I have these blank guns that are specific blank guns that the barrel are kind of chopped off so no projectile can come out. But they do sound like real guns. So a lot of times I'll give um, my sergeant or whoever the commander is on that shift, hey, I'm just letting you know I'm going to be here such and such shooting. Um, if you hear shots fired or anything, you know, you dispatch an officer, but just be this is us over here. So I, I, I know that. Um, so I usually have, um, I, I let them know ahead of time. And then I also put big signs up filming in progress. So there's no, uh, misunderstandings just in case a County unit or something that didn't get the message while comes up. And I usually always try to take those precautions to make sure, uh, those easy mistakes can happen. Yeah. That could end tragically. If, uh, yeah. I remember when I was in anti-crime years ago, some kids were doing student film with guns and they told nobody. Oh wow! It almost got ugly, you know. Yeah, it, it can happen quick because nowadays you never know. <laughs> yeah, no, because you know how do you know what the hell's going? On? Oh, we're shooting. Oh, how do we know that? Yeah, you know, yeah. All that in public. How about? Let me ask you something. You try to do these films for the lowest cost possible. Mm -hmm. Who finances your your films? It's me. I, I finance most of them. Um, the because I do most of the work behind the camera um i just you know i don't have to pay myself i can deter my own payment for if the film turns a profit uh so mostly i'm just paying my actors uh renting locations whenever i have to uh but other than that i'm trying to get as much as i can free to keep that cost down um but paying the actors a lot of my actors come from the memphis area or nashville so i have to pay you know gas and lodging for them as well so I keep that cost down as much as possible. And anything with a movie, almost all of the cost is the director, the cinematographer, the sound guy, the this and the that. So you can run into all of your costs there. But by me doing those jobs, I keep that cost extremely low. And my little budget is just to compensate my actors and to feed them and to lodge them if necessary. So that's how I'm able to make my movies on such a, a low cost is because I'm doing most of the uh, the cost jobs myself to to keep that budget down. So when Jerron Lockridge is shooting movie or the three Lockridge boys, they're not eating meat that that week. <laughs> <laughs> I don't go that that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're just getting beans they're getting rice and beans that week no no meat <laughs> yeah, usually you know if i work a, a couple hours of overtime or something especially at the beginning now my company has grown quite a bit to where it's kind of self-sustaining itself uh but yeah first off um you know i would save a lot of overtime checks uh in-service checks you know stuff like that to kind of get these um movies funded and uh and do it and now I'm fortunate to where my movies are starting to bring a little income in and they're just supporting themselves at the moment. So, uh, that's you know, fantastic. The, yeah. Yeah. Now, how about, how about your crew? A, where, where are they from? Mm -hmm. B, who trains them? Mm -hmm. And C, are they, uh, repeat crew members? Or are they do the one off and then they leaving after that? Yeah, for the for the longest, it was just my wife, <laughs> just me and my wife. Like literally, there was only two of us behind the camera. Um, I'm doing all of it, the lighting and everything. So here recently, uh, I have a guy that's um, doing like my sound, holding the boom mic and recording all the sound for me. 
uh, and I'm still handling the camera and doing the lighting and all of this and that. So um, he basically was basically on the job training for him. He's here local uh, where I stay and um, on the job training. And this next movie is like the first time that uh, I'm going to be able to kind of step away from the camera and let somebody else handle that job. So we're steadily growing to uh, get more and more um, to the way that I'm stepping away. And maybe one day I can just focus solely on directing other than doing a million jobs behind the camera. So it's getting there slowly um, as the more that my company grows. And um, because I have no intention of, of, of going the Hollywood route, I, I really want to build it uh, here in my community and build something self-sustainable with my company to the way, even though they're low budget, we're making high quality projects to the way that they have this indie feel, but they don't feel cheap. Right. Uh, um, I'm, I'm getting to that point, and that's where I kind of want to stay. I, I don't have any interest in going to a studio system or anything like that uh, because the industry has changed so much that you don't have to. Uh, streaming and stuff has opened the floodgates for you to be able to get your movie out there and make a profit um, without having to have Hollywood backing or millions and billions of dollars behind your movie uh you if, as long as you make a high quality project a lot of people will appreciate that Jerron, the movie the sticks which we have a a picture up on the screen mm -hmm. uh when that was released in this year right mm -hmm. uh now when it gets released where is it released to is it is it released on uh, uh you know netflix where where is what's your vehicle uh, actually it's not going to movie theaters right away right yeah, I, I, well, I started with um, mostly like what you call four walling when you rent your own movie theater and and, and put the movie in there and sell tickets. Uh, but now it's starting to be released in the streaming platforms. Uh, it's on Apple TV right now. Apple TV used to be called iTunes. Uh, uh -huh. You can get on Apple TV and watch it. Um, waiting on it to drop on Amazon any day. Uh, so it, it should probably be out today, tomorrow, who knows. And then um, Roku. So a lot of streaming channels are starting to license the movie and it'll be available. Uh, one thing about Netflix and Hulu, the, the real big platforms is they they are they're all about business. So, you know, business is the number one factor. So they're looking for notable faces more than stories. They want to know if you have Samuel Jackson in your movie because they want to drive subscribers to their platform. Which is understandable, uh, but you know, as of right now, until this little name gets a little bigger, Netflix probably won't be interested uh, in licensing the movie. So it'll be on Amazon. Amazon has licensed it, just waiting on it to go live. Apple TV has licensed it. Roku uh, is a platform that's upcoming called Tubi that's licensed it. Uh, and, a, and a few more I have to check uh, with my distributor and see, but it's, it's starting to slowly roll out there. That's great. You know, it's great that those platforms do exist mm -hmm. and that the rules, as you say, like Hollywood, aren't dictated to you. Yeah. And, um, a guy like you that is a man of many, many hats can survive in this world on, on a shoestring budget, but mm -hmm. you may not be on a shoestring budget much longer. Yeah. You know, you could take all you need is one movie to blow up. And, you know, the way you do things could change overnight. And not that what you're doing is wrong. I think it's fantastic, you know. But I'm sure, as you said, you'd rather just go behind the camera, not have to be the jack of all trades and be ha have more people to do the things that are sort of maybe burdening you now and not yeah. allowing you enough time uh, to do the directing as you would like to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the goal. The goal is just to create a, a self-sustaining company and employ people and, uh, you know, have jobs uh, because a lot of people here in, in my community are interested, kind of like it was when I first came out of high school. Um, I, I, if I had the belief that I could do filmmaking, I'm not sure if I would be an officer today, to be honest with you, um, because I probably would have went directly into trying to be a filmmaker and going that route. But I'm from Tennessee, little old Tennessee. Hollywood is thousands and thousands of miles away. I didn't have the money or the the drive to even want to go to move to LA, really. Uh, so um, here in Tennessee, and ended up going a different path. So, like a lot of kids 
who are coming up through school now who may be thinking, hey, I would love to do this and that, but those opportunities aren't here. Uh, and being able to provide those opportunities where when I was coming out of high school, I thought that was impossible where it could be possible here is, is one of my goals. I, I want to be able to provide that opportunity of, hey, if you want to be a part of the movie industry or the entertainment industry, you don't have to move all the way to Hollywood and, and, and do that. We have what we're building right here. Let me teach you these skills. Let me give you these skills and let me hire you to be a part of my company. So it's a slow burn. Uh, it's a, a big, ambitious idea, but I see it starting to come into fruition because the growth my company has had from this year to last is almost mind blowing. So I see, you know, the the more we create projects and just focus on making them high quality and great stories, I, I see my company starting to uh, to build toward that goal of mine, and and um, I, I can see it growing to the part to where maybe one day. I'm just sitting in the offices producing these projects and getting them out there and have my own little Hollywood sitting right here in Tennessee. You know something, Jerron? <clears throat> it's going to happen. Yeah. It's absolutely going to happen. Yeah. And uh, you're an inspiration to yeah. any small filmmaker that says, you know, you, you, <laughs> I use this example, you're the little engine that could, you know? <laughs> it's so true because you, you didn't let these obstacles stand in front of you. You went out and did it, and you're doing it. And, yeah. you know, something, you build a building one brick at a time and you're building your film company one film at a time. And yeah. that's something really to be proud of. And also for your kids, you know, it's not like you're not telling them to do something. You're doing it and you're giving an example to yeah. your kids, you know. And that's an amazing thing because people can, oh, do as I say, but not as I do, you know. Yeah. And, you know, when you're given that kind of type of example, to your kids and not just your kids, but other kids that see you doing this. It's tremendous. You know, look, I, I'm not, even myself, my kids see me after I left the police department, I taught college and I, I did stand up comedy. I tried acting. They, were, they saw I wasn't afraid to try anything. I maybe didn't succeed at everything or in the way that maybe I had wanted, but you know, when you try different things, that's admirable too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and just, just being, you know, courage having the courage enough to just to step out there and pursue different things uh it, it means a lot and you, you st i start to even see it with my own kids like they they um where they would probably be timid or something here and there just man you only live once try it you know go out there if it's something that you are interested in or passionate about just go out there and pursue it and um and just make it happen for yourself so hopefully you know by example i can be an inspiration to to, to somebody to go out there and just just go for it because um i up to the point where especially now at my department like so many guys are you know having to do these extra duty jobs and this and that and just can't seem to get out of the uniform whereas you know i've even though i still work full time i still i have this company on the side to where i don't have to deal with that so you know and, and, and it's growing to the point that one of these days I might have to make a decision. Do I go ahead and retire from this and pursue this full time? So it's it's a great balance to have. It's a great problem to have. Whereas uh, when I first started, I didn't see this as a possibility. So, uh, yeah, I just I just hope that uh, if there's anybody out there thinking that, hey, man, I wanted to pursue that dream, but this is my reality now. Uh, it's never too late. Uh, you can just go out there and, and, and give it a try. I mean, you only got one life to live. Sure. And John, you've been a you've been a police officer for 14 years, right? Do you have a 20 year retirement in Tennessee or is it more than that? We have um, my particular department. We have a 25. Uh, I think Tennessee wants you for 30. Uh, oh, but wow. when I um, I got out of high school, uh, I started at a, a mental health facility here in Tennessee that uses the same retirement uh, system. Plan. Yeah, the state retirement system. Yeah. yeah so I've actually been in it. In, in our retirement system since I was 19. So I would actually have 20 years next next year. Yeah. So um, that that's one of the things like, you know, if I can get to that 25 year mark and if my- You can do 25 <laughs> standing on your head. Yeah. <laughs> I'll so, tell you yeah. one thing, Jerron, you never want to let go of is that is the health insurance. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's another thing that man, this health insurance is something else. So yeah, that's a, uh, 
that's that's really heavy on your mind whenever you're thinking about doing something. Absolutely. Yeah. So you know, I with the I wanted to talk about how do you balance your time uh, mm -hmm. between police work, being a dad of three, mm -hmm. and doing your movies, and you know your financial struggles that everyone has in this life. Everything's really damn expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you balance all of that? It's um, it took a while to get to the point to where um, I had to figure that out. Uh, uh, so I, I I eventually figured it out. Um, just coming up with my own way of handling things. Um, it's all about scheduling. Uh, scheduling your time um, through the week. Um, you know, making sure that you have all the time for your family, and and when you do have the I, when I have to focus on my business, that I everybody knows like this is the time i gotta i gotta do this and just rationing my time accordingly and i'm, I'm a big schedule guy my my scheduling app my calendar app in my phone is filled up with stuff so i'm big on um uh, scheduling and and being planned out uh when it comes to my time and, and everything that i that i do so that's that's a help and then too uh at my job um I took a position uh, where I do a lot of more office stuff. So I, I work in the lobby, taking reporting, um, walk in reports, call reports, uh, warrant checks and stuff like that. So having that desk job allows me to do my job and on my downtime, I can write, uh, maybe do a little bit of editing and uh, do my film stuff to the way when I'm off and with the family, I can focus with the family. So it, it kind of kills two birds with one stone. And that helped out a lot, especially when it comes to my business stuff. And I'm gracious that the department had something like that to where they, you know, they don't um, have an issue with me when it's downtime at the job, working on my little uh, work stuff, writing and doing uh, stuff like that. So a lot of that just kind of worked out, worked itself out to the way I can, still have enough time for family, still have enough time for my business and myself when I need to and get everything done. That's great. Because you know, Jerron, there are some jealous people out there. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. <laughs> but there are some people that get jealous of what you're doing. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, it's like the, the, the making the soup. You know, you're, you're putting all the ingredients in it, but people want to eat the soup after you did all that work, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know, hey, it's 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 part of it. Uh, you know, I I I would hope nobody is, but you know, you, you live long enough to know that's not always the case. But I can't help that. I just have to to do what I have to do for to to get my goals and and uh, make sure I feed my family at the end of the day. One hundred percent. Tell me about your next big story for your next film uh, idea, and tell me about how it was generated, where you got the idea for it. Well, uh, my next one is, is um, it's called Cubic Zirconia. Uh, it's actually um, inspired by a, a case that um, I worked early on in my career. career um, and I wrote that story and it's a good old detective mystery. Uh, I love writing those type of stories and this is my first time actually being able to do so. And um, I've, I've currently in post-production editing, getting music done for it now and hoping to have that one ready to put out here by the end of the year. Um, but like with the sticks, I have this big universe that I'm creating. Uh, it's called the sticks universe where uh, these characters kind of can go off into their own movies. And I'm just looking at a broad array of stories like the sticks is my story about the narcotics unit and the gritty street life. And then I got this movie coming up called Cubic Zirconia is about a detective and what he deals with from missing persons to homicide and stuff like that. It's like my detective theme uh, movie. And then I have a another one coming out that's kind of patrol based to kind of show how the patrol officers deal with the, the beat of the street. So I'm going into these more street all type of facets of law enforcement to kind of show um, more authentic reiterations of those stories that you necessarily doesn't don't see on TV now uh, with, with a lot of these shows that, uh, like we mentioned before, can get too political for the wrong reasons. Like it, it doesn't show anything. And, and my thing is, 
I just want to kind of humanize the badge to kind of take this Superman vision that a lot of people have of us. Like, you know, we we're just Superman walking up and down the street. So like whenever you see a cop messing up, it's like so shocking. Like, no, he bleeds and breathes just like you. He deals with the same issues like you. And a lot of times we work the streets like um, on one story that I'm working on. This guy is constantly he, he he's working the streets, dealing with all this and that. And he has to go 10 eight and go in service to another call where a lot of people would see a, a child dead in the car and they're done for a month, two months, three months with therapy. We go 10 eight and go right to the next call. So right, right. A lot of these, you know, cops are dealing with so much that they're required to push down and maybe a ticking time bomb. So when you see this guy go off on a citizen doesn't necessarily mean that he's a bad person. You know, he just, all this stuff that he's been packing down over the years is just bubbling out all of a sudden. So a lot of stuff like that is what I'm passionate about showing through storytelling, especially now and just trying to, to humanize the badge and show this guy's the same person as you going through the same things that you go through. He just decided to answer a call in law enforcement and just kind of bring down that expectation that a lot of people have of us. Like we just do no wrong and, uh, you know, don't go through anything and we can handle it all and just bring down that Superman mantra and show you that we're people just like everybody else. You know, Jerron, that's so important because as you know, and, and, and it's a common known, that the police have one of the highest suicide rates of any profession. Probably yeah. one of the highest alcoholism rates of any profession. Probably one of the highest divorce rates of any profession. PTSD, I think we all have it. Yeah. After, you know, you've been on the job X amount of years. You got it. Whether yeah. you know it or not, you got yeah. it. Because yeah. it may take the form of you just waking up in the middle of the night because some really ugly picture came into your head yeah. of something you saw, something mm -hmm. that you did. And that's that's PTSD. Mm -hmm. And Many departments, as you know, they don't want to face it. But anything mental health wise, they're like, oh, take his guns, take his guns away from him, put him, you know, we used to call it the bow and arrow patrol, put him on the bow and arrow patrol, put him yeah. in the rubber gun squad, you know. And departments are just, you know, they're very slow to react to this. Yeah. yeah. That cops need help too, yeah. just like any other profession. But because of that gun that you live with day to day for your yeah. entire police career, it's almost a dirty word to discuss a mental health issue with anyone on the police department. Your thoughts? Yeah, and it is that's so true. And, and even my own department here recently, they've really started to where uh, if you need a, a mental health day to let somebody know and they'll give you, you know, time to go and talk to somebody. But, you know, the manpower is so short, you don't get much time. <laughs> you know, they, they need you back on the streets. And I understand that. Um, I mean, all the departments are dealing with the manpower issues and the streets have to be covered. The city has to be covered. Uh, but like a, a lot of these instances that a lot of police officers go through, um, like uh, I, I remember one clearly where um, this accident with injuries and you have two kids ejected, like in sitting there dealing with two dead kids, you shouldn't be expected to go back to work the next day, but all over the country you are, and That's they right. do, you That's know? Right. So um, a lot of that is, you know, it's, I tell anybody, this is not the worst physical job, but mentally it's, it's mental gymnastics. A lot of the time over your career and all that builds up, uh, but you're starting to see a lot of the mental health aspects start to get preached more. I guess now the taboo of, talking to somebody or the mental health of the job is starting to kind of get normalized. So you're starting to see a lot more departments uh, bring that out. But years ago, yeah, that was non-existent. Yeah, years ago, the therapy was, all right, I'll meet you at the bar and we'll stay yeah. till four in the morning and we'll drown yeah. our sorrows and drown our pain yeah. in alcohol. Yeah. And that's that's not a, a good idea. You know, I remember um, I had 17 years on the job when 9-11 uh, happened. Mm. And I worked all different facets, not just me. Uh, everyone on the NYPD worked all different. I was in the detective bureau at the time. Mm -hmm. And I had, you know, worked on the pile and I had worked down at the Fresh Kills and I worked at the morgue. And I never, I saw a lot of homicides. I never saw bodies in the condition I saw them at the morgue from the attacks of 9 11. 
-hmm. And it was a hard thing to see, you know, because these were regular everyday people going to work and yeah. they're killed in there. And then God, you know, you see the cops and the firemen that they brought in. It was horrible, you know? Yeah. And again, like you said, go home, you know, say hello to your family, be back tomorrow at 0600, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then I remember people during 9-11 would go into the commanding officer and say, I can't do these hours. My husband and I were both cops and we watch the kids. We alternate. To, and he, after a while, the commanding officer just said, okay. And he would hand them a form and they would look at it. It would be um, uh, resigning from the police department form or whatever it was called. He goes, listen, you know, your country was just attacked. I don't know what to tell you. I can't help you at this point, you know? So yeah. basically suck it up and, you know, you got to make other arrangements with your kids. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it was a, a hard lesson to learn. And during those times, as you say, you know, these are, I'm sure a lot of these stories have yet to be written of the, yeah. this year, what 9 11 is, uh, is 23 years ago. You mm -hmm. know, yeah. so yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a lot that, you know, you can expound on. And, and that's something that I'm, I'm passionate about now is just telling those type of stories, even though it may be unpopular now, uh, because I know. For a second there, a lot of networks and stuff didn't want anything cop related <laughs> put sure, on yeah. them all. But that's something that I'm passionate about now. Just to kind of show that that authentic side to the job. Like, uh, you know, it, it's a lot, um, you know, we were expected or still kind of are expected to kind of deal with and make sure you had work on time. You know, we you know, you're dealing with that. That's cool. But we still got a city to protect. We still got these issues to deal with. Just you know, deal with them how you deal with them, but just make sure that you're in a uh, roll call on time and um, just showing that 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 opposite side of the coin, um, what uh, what a lot of officers and people deal with um, when they're not at work or even when you don't see them at work is, is something that I'm passionate about showing and just kind of taking down that that Superman of expectations that uh, that a lot of people have on us. You know, some of the, uh, a lot of, to me, hero cops, too, were, were guys who did great things in the community. Mm -hmm. There's a guy who runs a um, pol pol police boxing program, uh, mm -hmm. Pat Russo. And I can't tell you how many kids he saved through mm -hmm. that boxing program. You know, kids right out of the projects, kids in the hood. Mm -hmm. And after a while, they look to him as the, a father figure because some of them don't have fathers. Mm -hmm. and he has saved so many kids through that police boxing uh, club. And it, it's an amazing thing to watch. And there's other detectives that work with him. And, and you know, same thing with the baseball programs and, you yeah. know, basketball programs they run for kids. And having cops involved in those things is a great thing because they're seeing the human side of police officers and they're not 5-0, 5-0, a pig yeah. or this. You know what I mean? They're not looking at it like that. They're looking at, oh, that's Officer Pat. He's yeah. a dude, man, you know, and they see it from a different, and I'm sure you have the same thing uh, at a different level in Tennessee. Yeah, and 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 by them doing that, those you know those officers have a perspective to to give those kids, to, you know, because they they see what happens. They see what happens when you're when you're in the street. They see the destructiveness of what happens going this path. So doing that and kind of leaning them to something more positive. Uh, and being able to answer these questions and give them their perspective, it's valuable. It's valuable. It's something that only we can give. Like that's why I said, like this job is we get all the criticism, uh, all of the criticism, but only cops truly know what cops go through. I mean, yeah. you, you almost have to do this job to truly understand uh, what it's like to do this job. So uh, I can I take my hat off to anybody who who does. Uh, you know, the boxing clubs and stuff like that to to have a positive influence out here and just not, you know, so gung-ho on, uh, we don't care about them, they don't care about us. Like, actually, right, right. to me, that's actually putting back into the community with a perspective that only we have. Yeah, you should never have that us-first-them mentality. Yeah. You know, I'm sure there's times you can feel that way, but that's yeah. not a good <laughs> And I remember, you know, there's so many, even on the police department, people don't understand some of the expressions we have. Like I used to love the expression, a million attaboys don't equal one ah shit. 
And that basically saying a million, oh, you're great, you're great. You make one mistake, and that's what you're going to be remembered for. And it's an unforgiving job in that way. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's so true. <laughs> You've got a expression in your next movie if you want. <laughs> I'm sure hey. you have some Tennessee expressions too, right? Yeah, yeah. Hey, that's that's a great one because it is so true. It's so true. You can do a million things right, but that one thing is what you'll be remembered for. 100%. You know, I taught, after I retired, I taught at a all-black and Hispanic college. Well, 99.9%. .9%. And I, I, you know, I was thinking, oh, man, what are these kids going to think of me? Because here's a white boy coming in and a homicide sergeant. And they were great. I love the kids. You know, yeah. it was challenging. I'm not going to act like it was all gravy or all ice cream, but it was it was good. I And I get, we got along. And yeah. But it was, you know, again, it, it was tough. It's just like anything. It's not... So yes, this is always wonderful. But yeah. it, there was a lot of I, I, I'm still in contact with a lot of those kids today. You know, yeah. They'll, yeah. they'll email me, oh, professor. They still call me professor, even though I've been out teaching for six or seven years. Could yeah. you write me a letter of recommendation? I'm like, oh, why do you always have to be? You're asking me for something, but you know, <laughs> it was it was it was a great experience. I actually taught there for over ten and a half years because I taught oh, there wow. full time. I was on the police department, and then I when I retired, I taught full time. But okay. uh, yeah, it was it was a great experience, and those are the things too that you know you meet characters like you need in your movies, and that's yeah. part of being also an observer of the human condition. I think that's yeah. probably the best way to put it, right? Yeah, that's the that's a perfect way to put it, and you know it, that's why like when I started writing, I was like I see and I observe like it's <laughs> it's a uh, it's a comedic um, storyline in the sticks. Uh, that um, uh, I experienced in some form uh, before, and I remember uh, uh, after the screening, they was like, "That was so wild!" Like, what makes you think of that? And, and just just having that innocent mind to think like nothing like that would ever happen is kind of amazing because we experience so much stuff that you know us fighting a naked guy to somebody normal they wouldn't think that would ever happen but like that's just a normal tuesday to us <laughs> you, know, you know us having these different type of experiences and able to put them in a story it's kind of enlightening and, and and funny at the same time well you know jerron i think that that's why cops have such a good sense of humor and they're, they're funny cops are funny uh, you know as a group i'm not saying all of them are funny yeah. but as a group cops are really funny because you have to laugh because if you don't laugh, you're going to cry, you know, and, yeah. and you got to make fun of things. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's how, look, how, but also like people don't understand is how cops rib each other mm -hmm. and bust each other's chops. Mm -hmm. You know, in some professions that would be looked at as, oh, I'm going to, you know, human resources yeah. and the police department. If you can't take that, you better leave. Yeah. You know, I remember seeing a video a while back. Uh, it was a crime scene and somebody had a camera recording like always. And um, these cops are out there kind of joking about the crime scene. So they were like, oh, this is the most terrible thing. These people are joking about this person dying in the house. I was like, no, that's a coping mechanism. Like they're, they're, they're not trying to dwell on the crap they just saw. They're just making those jokes to take their mind off of it. So that's it's one of the things that only we would understand, you know. That's <laughs> we rib and joke with each other about stuff that most people would be like, you know, looking at you like, what's wrong with that person? Because that's a way of dealing with that situation. So yeah, that's the only thing that like you know only cops can understand that type of stuff. <laughs> Ron, you're a hundred percent right, and you're right. People observing that yeah. can understand that they may look at it as a disrespectful, but yeah. uh, it is your hundred yeah. percent a coping mechanism. I just want to put you back up on the screen for a second. Folks, it's been my privilege today to interview Jerron Lockridge, a Tennessee police officer turned movie producer. I should have put more on that slash writer slash director slash dad uh, <laughs> slash husband. He has to wear all these hats and he's doing an unbelievable job. And I, I really, really mean this. I, I think that in a year or two, you're going to go back and look at uh, Jerron Lockridge and say, holy shit, this guy, he did it. He did it. He really did something besides, and look, it's enough to be a cop, but he took his training as a cop and he took all the experiences and he did something really positive and really positive, not just for himself and his family, but the community. And he's, look, I could see just interviewing you right now, Jerron. You're looking to give back too to the community. Yeah. 
You're not just doing this uh, all for yourself. You're, you're giving back to the community. And Jaron, I'm going to, since we're, all, we're just about at an hour, I'm going to give you your final thoughts. You can read the Gettysburg Address, whatever you want to do, your final thoughts. I just say, uh, you know, anybody out there who's who's interested in, in what I got going on, just just look me up on social media, uh, and, and you're welcome to follow me, uh, interact if you got questions or anything uh, about, you know, if you're interested in getting a book off or uh, doing a movie yourself, hey, uh, feel free to reach out, uh, and um, hopefully you will support this project, the sticks that you see over my shoulder back there, um, when it starts uh, slowly um, posting on platforms, uh, hopefully it'll be on Amazon real soon. Uh, I know a lot of people love that platform and 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 more uh, platforms to be announced. So uh, I just uh, want to thank you first and foremost for having me on today. And I really enjoyed our conversation today. It was fantastic. Jerron, I'm going to reach out to you again. Uh, if, if you could stay around when I go off the air just for a minute or so. Okay. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed talking to you. And I, uh, Look, next year I know you're going to be much, much bigger. And I'd like to say I want to stay in contact with you in case you become real famous, you know. So focus police off the cuff, real crime stories. But this is the Law and Crime author series. And we have slash movie producer, director, all of those things that Jerron Lockridge is. Have a great day, everyone, and God bless. One episode, just ain't enough.